them to, to Olivia. Uh, so uh, today we have Olivia Fisset, an advanced research computing analyst from the University of Saskatchewan and Westgrid. Olivia has background in biophysics and molecular dynamics. Uh, he has a PhD from Université Laval and uh, some postdoctoral experience in Germany. Almost two years ago, we had an introductory webinar on VMD by uh, Dmitry Rosmanov, and you can find that webinar on uh, Westgrid's training materials website. So today, Olivier will cover more advanced features of VMD, such as trajectory, scripting, and animation. And on that note, I will pass the microphone to Olivier. Thank you, Alex. After this introduction, there is uh, not much else to say. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope uh, you will find this webinar interesting. And let's jump right away into advanced VMD topics. So before we begin the topics, I'd like to highlight that all the uh, demo that I will show today are available uh, in a downloadable archive, which you can find on the Compute Canada uh, Nextcloud website. If you use a downloader such as the bold you get, you will need to specify the uh, output name, such as O option with double you get. Uh, it's a tar archive, so extract it with tar or your favorite archive manager, and you can reproduce everything that I will show here today. So as Alex pointed out, this is the continuation of a previous workshop. In the previous webinar, uh, we saw the basics of uh, VMD, loading structures, how to show them on the screen, select colors and representations. Today, I want to uh, tackle the topics of trajectories, movies, and scripting. There is a lot to say about those three topics. So actually, we'll be, I'll, be going, I'll be giving mostly an overview. But in a last point, I'd like to show a practical example of combining trajectories, movies, and scripting together to do uh, some pretty uh, nice and advanced uh, movie with VMD. However, um, I'm not going to only jump right away into trajectories, movies, and scripting. I'd like to go back to some of the basics, what I have highlighted here on the screen, just so that we are all on the same pages, that we're familiar with loading structures, how to show them on the screen, how to do atom selections, and how to navigate uh, the 3D structure or trajectories that we show on the screen. So let's start with that, the basics of VMD. So when you first open uh, VMD, you will be presented with two windows, the main window, that is the uh, program interface, and the OpenGL display where the structures will be shown. Now, if we want to add a molecule or actually a structure to our um, OpenGL display, we go to the new molecule entry, which you'll find in the file menu. So file new molecule, and then this will open what is called the molecule file browser. From there, you can hit the browse button and you will be presented with a file selector. Here, for instance, I'm going to go in the lysozyme in water directory, which you will find in today's archive of downloadable stuff. And from there, I will select the conf.grow file. If you've performed simulations with GrowMax, you're already familiar with grow files and you know that conf.grow is a standard name for the input structure of your MD simulations. So I'm going to load my conf.grow. I hit the OK button here, and then back to the molecule file browser, I click load. And here I have my molecule loaded on the screen. I can close the molecule file browser, and voila. So if we recapitulate this very simple process, uh, the VMD interface uses many, many windows, but all of them, you can always find them through the main window. So the main window is really your uh, central viewport. It gives you access to all the controls and all the other windows. There is a single OpenGL window. So if you load several structures, they will all be shown uh, on this single screen. Now, VMD uh, supports a wide variety of file formats and they are automatically detected. For instance, when we loaded our conf.grow file, we did not have to specify that it was a grow file. From the file extension and the file contents, VMD was able to detect that automatically. Now with a structure loaded, um, we don't see much actually on the screen. It looks like a blob, 
we can guess that it's a protein, but it's actually just a few lines there. We need a better graphical representation in order to make sense of what is in this structure. We can change the graphical representations through another uh, VMD window. We go to the graphics menu, and then we choose the representations item, and this will open the graphical representations window. From there, we can see that we have a pane that shows uh, all the different representations that are currently loaded. And right now there's a single one. It tells us that the style is to display lines. It displays colors according to atom name. So for instance, uh, oxygens are red and hydrogens are white. And it shows all the atoms, which is selection all. We're going to change that. We're going to uh, put a new drawing method, which we say new cartoon instead. This is a typical drawing representation for protein. And since it applies only to proteins, we're not going to see the water anymore. We're also going to change the coloring method. So on the upper uh, option here, we say let's color according to secondary structure. And now we can see that our uh, alpha helices are drawn in purple. We have some beta strands in yellow. The uh, loops and turns are in white and cyan. So this allows us to uh, make a lot more sense of the structure. But since the water is no longer shown, I'm going to show you how you can create additional graphical representations. VMD allows you to have several representations for the same structure. We can create one with this uh, create representation button here. So we hit it and we get immediately a second entry in our pane menu. So from there, we're going to change the selection. This time we say we want a representation that's going to apply only to the water. So we input water instead of all. For the drawing method, we're going to go with points. Points are very small. They give us a rough idea of where atoms are in space but it doesn't draw anything else. So it's a very lightweight representation. And we're going to color them again, according to atom name. Once we're done, we can close our graphical representation window. And we are left now with something that's much easier to uh, view and to appreciate. We can now clearly see that we have a protein inside a box of water. So again, if we recapitulate graphical representations, in VMD, each structure can have one or several graphical representations. And VMD calls this uh, calls structures like molecules. This is a bit of a misnomer and an inf of unfortunate name because inside a structure, you can have several molecules. But every time you load a structure in VMD, VMD calls that one molecule. That's it. Uh, you have a wide array of drawing styles, and they were discussed ex uh, extensively during the first VMD workshop. So I'm not going to go back uh, on them now. Just we've already seen the lines, the points, and the cartoons. You could show spheres or surfaces to appreciate the uh, space that's occupied by atoms. You can go with licorice or balls and sticks if you like the old style organic chemistry look. And you can color these representations in a wide variety of ways. Uh, we've seen by atom name, by secondary structure, but you could also go with residue type to highlight the hydrophobic and polar patches on your protein, etc. And finally, we've seen that atom selections can be used to selectively display parts of a structure. Here, for instance, we showed a representation for only the water. So this uh, selection applies always to a single representation, which means that if you have several representations, you can have several selections and therefore you can show different parts of the proteins or different parts of your structure in uh, different manners. And the way VMD allows you to select atoms is actually very powerful. This is what VMD calls its atom selection language. Here, I show examples of what you can do with the atom selection language. Many of these examples are pulled directly from the VMD documentations. Others come from my own experience. I've added them because I think they're helpful. I don't want to go over them all now. That would be rather tedious. Uh, they are included here so that you can have a bit of, re of a reference and know what is possible. But let's have a look very quickly at some of them. It's possible to do simple things such as uh, according, uh, showing according to just a property such as the atom name or the residue ID. You can work with ranges, for instance here, 
res ID 35 to 40. The selection language is also a logic uh, language. So you can use keywords such as and, or, not, for instance, name CA and res name ALA. And you have some pretty uh, convenient shortcuts such as backbone, protein, water, things like that. So you don't have to code anything very hard yourself. You can just say, well, protein or you know, the backbone and you're done. Uh, you can uh, select according to some pretty advanced uh, comparisons. For instance, here, Z under six or over three. This is practical if you are simulating a protein in a membrane and you want to select certain atoms in a slab according to the Z axis in your simulation. You can also show, uh, say, atoms that are close to other atoms. If you have a metalloprotein and you say within five of name Fe, and you're going to show all the atoms that are close to your uh, iron atom in your metalloprotein, for instance. So now let's finish up the basics by going over how we navigate uh, in the 3D space in VMD. Mostly this is done with the mouse using the left mouse button. When you hold the left mouse button with your mouse, you can uh, rotate the structure around two axes. If you uh, make an up and down motion, you rotate around the X axis. If you use uh, left and right motion, you will rotate around the Y axis. And if you switch to the right mouse button, this allows you to rotate along the uh, Z axis. And finally, you can zoom in and out of the structure using the mouse wheel button. There are also some rather practical keyboard shortcuts that allow you to switch between modes. Uh, when you start VMD, by default, you are in what is called the rotate mode. You can uh, change to say the translate mode by hitting T and then you'll be able to uh, just move the protein around in a translation motion using your mouse. And you can always hit the very practical equal key that will reset the view to what it was originally. Now, this is a bit uh, abstract to do uh, just on a slide. So for this particular demo, I'd like to open VMD with a protein structure and show you briefly how we navigate in GD. So please tell me if uh, the VMD window is not showing up okay. And I believe this should be fine. We're browsing for the file I described earlier, this conf.grow. Going to load it here. Set a representation. Create a new representation only for the water. And now I can navigate if I use the left mouse button. So this way and that, that way and that. If I use the right mouse button, then I'm doing this motion around the Z axis. And using the mouse wheel, I can scroll in and zoom onto my molecule. And whenever I hit the equal key, I go back to what it was originally. So now that we have these basics out of the way, I'd like to move on to some uh, advanced or let's say intermediate topics, trajectories, movies, and scripting. So for trajectories, I will first cover uh, the, basic, um, the, the basic concepts of uh, movie, of tra trajectories, loading trajectories in VMD. And then I'll have two um, subsections, one on troubleshooting, because trajectories is some place where it's easy to get things wrong. And I want to show you some typical mistakes that happen. And I'll have a very short section on post-processing trajectories, because it is tightly linked to troubleshooting. Now, I think I'm going to stop my video at this point, in case it interferes with some of the uh, demo that I'm going to show later. Again, if the video or the uh, audio breaks up, just tell me and I'll, we'll fix things. So just as for structures, VMD can read a variety of trajectories in many formats. 
if you do your MD simulations with NAMD or with the venerable charm, you'll be able to open your DCD files. If you work with Gromax, you either use compressed trajectories in XTC format or uncompressed tra uh, TRR trajectories. That works too. And if you use Ember to generate your trajectories, your CRD files are supported in addition. So trajectory loading is, uh, of course, fun for interactive visualization, but it's also something that you can use to do analysis directly in VMD. You might be uh, used to doing your analysis using, say, the Gromax tools or the uh, Ember CPP trash, but it's also possible to do some analysis in VMD. This is not something we'll cover today, perhaps in a later webinar. And of course, trajectory support allows us to make movies. Most of the controls for the trajectory are available directly from the main window. If we go back, for instance, to uh, the typical main window display that we have here, we have our conv.grow uh, structure that was loaded. And we can see we have one frame here. What this, what this means is that VMD considers if you load a structure that it's actually like a trajectory containing one frame. Actually, VMD doesn't make any difference between a structure, a trajectory. It just is stuff that contains frames for VMD. And at the bottom here, we can see a panel with all the animation controls. We will go over these one by one once we have loaded a trajectory. And loading a trajectory is actually done exactly like we do for structures using the molecule file browser. So since we already have our conv.grow file loaded, and since the trajectory that we have in the demo goes with that protein, what we want to do is not create a new molecule for now, but rather add the data, the trajectory data, to this existing molecule. So what we do is right click on this conf.grow entry in the VMD main window, and we select load data into molecule. So this will open the molecule file browser, but it also automatically puts us back to conf.grow uh, and say, well, now you can load additional files for this structure. We hit the browse button once again. And this time we select not a structure, but a trajectory. Here I select trajectory raw.xtc, which is an unprocessed trajectory that I got from an MD simulation. I hit the OK button, and then I can load my trajectory. We can see that VMD automatically, oops, sorry, detected the file format as a Gromax compressed trajectory. So we hit load, and we can now see that the, uh, the, the file has been loaded into the molecule. We close our file browser. And once that's done, we're back to our VMD main window and we can see that it's been updated. Our conf.grow structure is now associated to 502 frames. And now we can go over the animation controls at the bottom. So briefly, we have some of them that are pretty obvious because they look like the controls that you have in typical multimedia application for instance, play forward, or if you have the one pointing left, play in reverse. The buttons that are right next to it allow you to step one frame at a time forward or backward. There is also a looping mode that determines what happens when the uh, trajectory has been played over the whole space. With loop, it goes back to the beginning. You can say just end when the trajectory is over, or you can even say, once you've played forward, play it backward, which is what VMD calls a rocking motion. Here you have the trajectory step. When you use the default value of one, you're showing each and every frame one at a time. You can change this, however, to display only once every two frames, etc. And you can uh, see at which speed this is playing by adjusting the slider here. On the top, we have shortcuts to jump directly to the beginning and to the end of the trajectory. We have the frame number we are at at this moment, and you can type a frame number here to jump directly to that frame. Or you can click or drag on the slider here to um, move around the trajectory. So it's better to just illustrate this with a demo. So 
I'm going to go back to my VMD window and add the data to the molecule. So I browse for my trajectory, trajectory raw.xtc, and I load it. Now you can see that it is uh, loading and playing the trajectory frame by frame as they are loaded into the memory. Once this is done, I can close my file browser and now I'm free to move, jump around and do what I want with uh, my uh, trajectory there. So now let's uh, go into troubleshooting uh, trajectories. So the you might already have noticed something a bit strange. We have a rather unexpected frame number here, 502. What does that come from? What I actually loaded was an XTC trajectory that contained 500 uh, snapshots from an MD simulation. So why am I presented with 502 frames instead of 500? There are a few things we need to understand to explain this. First, VMD has no separate concepts of topology versus trajectory. If you work with Gromax, you are used to having a TPR file or a Grow file and to have a corresponding trajectory in XTC, two separate concepts. If you use a Charm or NameD, you're used to have a top file and to have your trajectory too. And you're used to these two separate concept of a topology versus a trajectory. VMD doesn't. It starts by loading a, a, a structure, such as a grow or a PDB file, and then it adds frames in addition to the structure. So that means your first frame in your trajectory in VMD is actually your original topology. Now, another thing we need to understand is most MD simulation programs will store the initial coordinates as a frame before recording snapshots, which means that my XTC file actually contains 501 frames and not 500. So in total, that means you usually have two more frames than expected. And the first two frames in your trajectory will always be identical if you use the same topology and starting structure. Now, another thing you might have noticed while the trajectory was playing is that sometimes our cartoon protein representation was really wrong. It looked like what we have here on the uh, right and top of the screen. We see that we have a cartoon, but it's weirdly going all across the simulation box. So why is this happening? When you do your MD simulations, you know that you are simulating a finite size system and that you use this sort of Pac-Man trick to make it look infinite when an atom exits the box that you're simulating through the top, it re-enters through the bottom. So this is what happens here. Our protein is near the top of the box and some atoms have actually left the box and re-entered through the bottom. Unfortunately, VMD is not smart enough to realize that these uh, atoms actually should look like they were on top of the others. Instead, it makes a bond between the atoms across the whole box, which is wrong. So when atoms are bonded across periodic boundary conditions like this, your representations will look rather strange. In fact, this uh, problem on top is pretty mild compared to what you can get uh, in bad situations. For instance, on the bottom here, I have what happens with a typical simulation of a water box with Gromax. Here we can see that the water molecules at the edges of the box are separated. Some atoms are inside the box and some atoms exited the box and re-entered through the other sides. So we have lines extending in a perpendicular manner all across the box and it really looks like a mess. The only way to fix this is to do post-processing of our trajectory as I'll show a little bit later. But before we jump into post-processing, there are two other errors uh, that you will or might get with VMD that I want to uh, touch on. First is often you will get VMD complaining about a mismatch between the number of atoms in your topology and your trajectory. And when I say trajectory and topology, I mean the first structure you loaded in VMD and then the trajectory file that you try to load on top to add more frames. 
So the problem is these files must match exactly. They must have the exact number, the exact same number of atoms, and the atoms must be the same. So for instance, if you post-process your trajectory and say, mm, I'm going to remove the water from my trajectory because I'm only interested in the protein, then you need to have a corresponding structure file with only the protein where you've also removed the water. So you need to make a new topology every time you do post-processing to generate a new trajectory as if you change the number of atoms. Another thing that you will often encounter in VMD is an out of memory error, or in a very bad situation, VMD might just outright crash. Why does this happen? The answer is that VMD loads all the trajectory frames in memory at once. So if you're used to working with CCP trash or with uh, trash conv or with some analysis tools from Gromax, this is not how they work. They load one or a few frames into memory, they process them, they write them back, and that's it which means that these tools are able to work on very large trajectories. This is not the case for VMD. VMD wants to allow you to move very uh, quickly between the frames at the beginning and the end of the trajectory. And the way it does that is to load everything in memory, which means that your trajectory file must fit inside your machine's memory. But it's not enough to just look at the file size because compressed trajectories require more memory than the file size. For example, the compressed XTC file that I loaded in this demo is about 60 meg megabytes. But if I check uh, the memory that VMD is using in the background, it, that is about 250 megabytes of memory, so about four times the file size. So you need to take this into account before you attempt to load large trajectories in VMD. So how do you avoid this problem? Well, again, with trajectory post-processing. You will use this to reduce file size. And there are a few options for that. Removing atoms, skipping frames, or um, focusing only on a specific time range. So let's go into uh, post-processing now. I don't want to uh, discuss a lot about post-processing because this is going to be specific to your own MD tool. However, I want to give the basics and to show you an example with Gromax. So what is actually uh, trajectory post-processing? It's just transforming your raw MD trajectory through one or more operations. We can use this for a variety of reasons. First, we could want to make molecules whole, uh, what we call periodic boundary recondition treatment. This is what I talked about earlier when I said that molecules were broken across uh, the periodic boundary frontiers. Another thing you can do is center your system on a selection. For instance, if you're interested in a protein and your protein is constantly jumping around the box, it might be easier for you to say, let's center on the protein on the screen. Uh, more than just centering, you could do an RMSD minimization to fit the protein so that you will be able to focus on the local motions inside the protein instead of seeing the whole protein tumbling in the box. Another thing you could do, which I've mentioned earlier, is removing atoms inside or uh, outside of a selection. So for instance, if you have a trajectory that's too large to fit into memory, you could say, let's remove all the water. After all, water make up 85, perhaps 90% of your simulation. Let's keep only the protein, and this will make my file 10 times smaller, much easier to fit it in VMD's memory. You could also remove frames outside of a time range. For instance, if you've performed some analysis and you say, oh, I have a very interesting binding or unbinding motion that's happening between 5 and 15 nanoseconds in my simulation, then you can say everything that's before 5 and after 15 nanoseconds, that's not really important. So I'm going to post-process my trajectory to retain only that time range. And this is going to make my file much smaller. You could also try skipping frames. If, for instance, you say, I record in my MD simulations uh, snapshots every one picosecond, you could say, OK, well, perhaps it's enough to show them in VMD um, one every five picoseconds. So you could say, let's skip, let's retain one frame out of five and skip the other four. So this post-processing makes some analysis easier. For instance, computing RMSD if you have already applied a fit and it certainly makes visualization much easier. 
So here is an example of how you would do uh, post-processing with a typical uh, GrowMax trajectory. Now I say typical and unfortunately the way you do post-processing will be very different depending on what you're actually doing. But here I have um, what is really the basic for a protein in a water box. I start by centering the proteins and making the molecules whole. So let's not go over all the options here, but I'm calling GrowMax with the trgconv tool to convert the trajectory. And I'm using the center and PBC mole option to center and make molecules whole. Then in subsequent steps, I will do more post-processing. For instance, here I will apply an RMSD minimizing fit. Then I will remove the non-protein atoms so that I can exclude the water and keep only the solute. And since this changes the number of atoms, I need to create a new topology for that protein on lead trajectory, which I can also do conveniently with trgconv. And this file is given as an example in the downloadable files. So now that I've post-processed my trajectory, I can load it in VMD and see how it's different. I will go again to my new molecule um, browser and I will choose this time confprotein.grow, which contains only the protein. Then I will add to this structure the post-process trajectory, trashprotein.xtc. And now I have to show you in the VMD window so that you believe me that this actually fixed our problem. I'm going to stop displaying the original trajectory. And we can see that now our protein is centered on the screen. It never breaks apart. We never have atoms one side or another side of the box. Everything is fine and we can focus on local motions because we have removed the tumbling. So this concludes our overview of trajectories. Now we'll move on to uh, making movies with VMD. I will first present some basic uh, concepts and then we'll jump into using the movie maker, which is a simple way of doing movies and also rather efficient. So making a movie in VMD is a three-step process. You have to focus first on what you want to do. What do you want to animate? Is it a trajectory that you want to play in time? Is it a structure, a single structure, but you want to rotate the viewpoint around the structure? Do you want to do both, play a trajectory while at the same time changing the viewpoint? So this is your first step. Then you need to render movie frames from this trajectory. So this is like a frame by frame animation. You can generate, for instance, a thousand different frames at different uh, points in time or at different angles of rotation. And then in the third step, you need to encode these separate frames into a final movie. So this is the encoding step. So the animation and the rendering, you have two options to do them in VMD. Either that can be done through the movie maker or you can do it via scripting. And for the encoding step, you can also rely on the movie maker or if you prefer, you can use your own external tools to assemble the frames and generate the movie. So regarding animating, your first option, the easiest is to use the movie maker. What can you do with the movie maker? Well, of course, if you have a trajectory, you can simply look at how the trajectory unfolds in time. If you have not a trajectory, but a single structure, you can have some predefined uh, viewpoint uh, animation, an eight uh, shaped loop in the XY plane or a rotation around the Y axis. So this is very easy to do animating with the movie maker. However, what you can do is also pretty limited. So once, when you've uh, exhausted the possibilities of the movie maker, you might want to move on to movie maker plus scripting. There, you still use the movie maker, but you add a user defined procedure that actually controls the animation. So you can step through a trajectory, change the viewpoint, do all that together. It's a lot more flexible, but it's a, more, it's a bit more effort. Or you could forego the movie maker entirely and go with pure scripting. I'm not going to describe how to do that in this uh, tutorial, however, but this of course would give you total control over what's happening in VMD. Now for the second step rendering, typically you do this via the movie maker. 
So you, uh, there is no actually any explicit need for you to deal with rendering in Movie Maker. If you're not interested in getting separate frames, but you just want to do uh, to, to get the final movie, you can just uh, tell Movie Maker to not create the frames and skip directly to the next step, encoding. Or if you want, you can generate individual frames either in JPEG or in Targa format. This you will do when you want to do the encoding yourself using an external tool. This is an additional step, but in my experience, it gives much better quality movies. Uh, and it's also possible to do the rendering via scripting, but we're not going to touch this again uh, during this workshop. Now for the encoding, your two options is either Movie Maker or your own external tools. If you use Movie Maker, you'll be able to generate a movie in MPEG-1 or MPEG-2 format. It also supports animated GIFs, which theoretically would work on the web, but that's pretty old school. And Movie Maker also requires external tools to be installed to do this assembly anyway, either PPM to MPEG, M encoder, or FFmpeg. In my experience, the movies that are generated through the Movie Maker are somewhat low quality. They used old codecs. They're not really, say, Hollywood quality. You can do much better if you take the time to use external tools to generate the movie. So for instance, you could use FFmpeg to produce an MP4 format video with a modern co co codec such as H.265. Uh, if you use your own external tools to do the encoding, that also opens up lots of possibilities. You could, for instance, post-process the frames using other tools to make funky uh, stuff. For instance, you could add text labels, you could add graphs, you could also add audio once you've uh, encoded your movie. Uh, using Audacity, for instance, if you want to add comments to a video, perhaps you're preparing this for a YouTube channel, for instance, and you want to describe what is happening in your simulation. So if you're using the Movie Maker, um, the steps are pretty simple. You start by loading your trajectory and your structure in VMD. You set up your graphical representations like we've already seen. You can also use a nice trick, which is called trajectory smoothing, which I'll present a bit later. And then you start the Movie Maker. It's just a simple matter of setting some animation options, choosing rendering options, and then you hit the start button and it can take some time because generating all the frames is a rather intensive process. Now let's see how this is done in practice. We already have our uh, lysozyme trajectory loaded from a post-process trajectory. We're going to set our representations the way we want them, say secondary structure uh, via cartoons and coloring. And then we're going to um, change something else. We're going to go to the trajectory tab here and we are going to increase what is called the smoothing window size. Now, I would really like to show you uh, what this does to the simulation in real time. Unfortunately, uh, the internet connection is just not fast enough for this. You're going to see a um, say really choppy movie if I try to play this. Instead, I'm going to describe what happens. When you increase the smoothing window, what VMD does is that it averages the frames. Instead of showing just one frame and then jumping to the next frame, it computes an average over one, uh, well, over two or more frames, which means that the trajectory will progress from one frame to the other in a smoother manner. If uh, you remember, or if you've tried yourself to, pre to, to uh, play some trajectories in VMD, or in any other program, you might have noticed that MD trajectories, they sometimes look very busy, very choppy. This is for, there are several reasons for that. One is that we record snapshots once every picoseconds, typically, or once even every five picoseconds. So everything that's happening in between is lost. So we kind of jump between two frames. So we don't see a smooth progression between them. Another reason is that you have thermal fluctuations in the water bath, and these will always hit the protein and make things jump around a little bit. By uh, increasing the smoothing window, you make the protein trajectory much smoother and easier to appreciate. However, there's a danger to using the uh, smoothing feature and I'm going to show you uh, this right now. Here, I'm creating a new representation. I'm going to show only the lysine amino acids. That's not because lysine is my favorite amino acid or something like that. I really just want to show 
what can happen when you make a bad use of trajectory smoothing motions. I've colored them in red so that they're easy to see. And now I'm going to increase the trajectory smoothing to five. And to allow you to see what happens, I'm going to zoom into the trajectory. And we can see that the uh, lysine amino acid side chains look really wrong. The uh, side chain looks like it's been pulled apart. And if you look at the uh, basic moiety at the end of the side chain, the bonds are very short. Sometimes the atoms are even, ov even overlapping each other. So what happens though, if I remove the trajectory smoothing, then I'm back to a normal situation. What happens is that when you smooth things like this, you get an average of frames. And this average is not a physical situation. So it may look nice, especially for the protein backbone, but it's not strictly speaking correct. So you need to be very careful when you use smoothing and never use smoothing for uh, explicit atomic representations. So now that we have everything set up, we start our movie maker. Here we have the window of the movie maker and we have a few options to set. First, we'll choose the renderer. Uh, for this demo, I just suggest you stick with snapshot because it's fast, but when you have uh, trajectories, well, movies that you want for, to make for publication or to upload on the internet, I would suggest you switch to the internal tachyon ray tracer, which has much higher quality. Then in the movie setting, we're going to say, display the trajectory. This is what we're interested in. For the format, I keep the default MPEG-1 encoded via PPM to MPEG. Then I'm going to set a temporary working directory so that VMD can create frames and do the encoding. I'm going to set a name for the movie. Here, my protein is the lysozyme. So I'm going to call it lysozyme. The rotation angle here parameter is going to be ignored. It is relevant only when you're animating a single structure and rotating the viewpoint. What is important, however, is the next trajectory step size. So I'm going to say encode every trajectory frame. VMD will automatically uh, guess the movie duration for us, assuming a 24 frame per second uh, frame rate. With this set, I just hit make movie, and then we have our movie uh, generated. Um, I don't think it's really worth me um, showing the movie over the internet right now because it's going to play very choppy anyway. But if you follow these steps, you should be able to generate your own and to play it. So now let's go into our last topic of the day, scripting. We'll cover the basics of scripting, especially the three main ways we do them through VMD, either by inputted command in the TK console, how we work with external tech scripts, tickle scripts, and how we can make a special script called VMDRC to customize VMD. So what do we uh, talk about when we say scripting VMD? It's controlling VMD using text commands. Now you might be wondering why would I want to do that when VMD has a very nice graphical interface for me to do everything? Well, actually it can be easier to work with text commands. Uh, for instance, VMD uses many, many windows and rather convoluted menus. It can be pretty easy to just replace some uh, complex things by simple commands. Another thing is that it can be easier, uh, it can be faster to use this. For instance, if you want to automate a repetitive command. Uh, a third reason to use this is because uh, you increase the reproducibility of what you do with VMD. If you can store your commands in a text script, then the next day or one week later, you can repeat them. You don't have to remember the commands exactly. And you don't have to wonder if, oh, am I getting exactly the right command order? Am I seeing exactly the same viewpoint as before? No, this is all stored in your script, so you're fine. And there are several ways to control VMD using text commands. We'll be looking at three of them, typing in the TK console, loading scripts using the play command, and creating the VMD RC file. So let's start with an empty VMD session and show the TK console. If you go to the extension menu, you will see an entry called TK console. I will open this and I get a new window showing on top 
which is called the scripting or TK console window. Here I can input text commands and they will be they will control what happens in VMD. For instance, if I type mol new one bptl.pdb, what this will do is load a new molecule call, uh, from an existing PDB file, one btl.pdb, which is a beta lactamase taken from the PDB database. And that's it. My, my protein is loaded directly on the screen. So this is actually much faster than having going to go through the file, new molecule, opening the molecule browser, opening the file browser, clicking OK, clicking load, and then closing again the window. If you remember these uh, commands that you use very often, you can speed up your uh, way in VMD. Now, however, you're going to say, well, how do I know what, what command I need to input to do something specific in VMD? And there's a very easy way to do this. I don't want to start showing, an, uh, say, a big dictionary of commands. Instead, I'm going to show you how you can find out which command you want. So you do this uh, in the file menu by selecting log tickle commands to the console. Once you've done that, everything you do in VMD graphically will have a corresponding entry in the console. For instance, if I add, if I change the, the representation to licorice and color by residue type, I will see that this corresponds to the mole mode style and mole mode color commands. They are automatically added to the TK console and I can use them again later if I want. When you're done, you just turn off logging and uh, this will stop being output on the console. There is also uh, online a very uh, interesting reference with, to all the text commands that are supported by VMD. So now another way to uh, control VMD via text commands is to have scripts. Scripts are exactly the same things that you would write in the TK console, except you put them in a text file. Here, for instance, I will set some uh, visualization options and I will create a new representation for a structure with a cartoon and color it according to secondary structure. This I put in a file and then I go back to my VMD window and type in the console play and the name of the script. And this will automatically run the commands that are inside the script. So I get what I wanted, setting the background to white, creating an, a new representation for a cartoon with secondary structure coloring. And there's a special script that's called the VMD RC, which will be played when you start VMD, which means that if you want to have a command always executed with VM, when VMD starts, you can put it in your VMD RC. That could be setting a specific display option, but it could also be adding a keyboard shortcut or even uh, redefining uh, the colors in VMD. For instance, here is a, a simple example of a VMD RC where I say, okay, I prefer an orthographic uh, display pr pr projection instead of the perspective. I like a white background. I don't want to display the axis. I add some uh, keyboard shortcuts to show or hide the axis, and I redefine some colors. Always end your VMD RC with this entry here, menu main on, to show the main VMD window. And that's it. Now uh, it's time to have a last example of how we can combine these three things, trajectories, movies, and scripting to uh, do a nice animation that will um, be very high quality and that you can use to go uh, further and really customize things to your liking. So what we'll try to do here is animate a, tra a trajectory. So again, it's the same protein, lysozyme, but this time it's in, instead of being in water, it's inside an alcohol solvent box, so it will unfold. And we want to see the unfolding as a trajectory progress. But we also want at the same time to rotate the viewpoint around the protein while the trajectory advances so that we get a good view of the protein. In addition, VMD only computes the secondary structure once. But since we are unfolding the lysozyme during the trajectory, the secondary structure will change a lot. So we want VMD to recalculate it at each trajectory frame. So we want to do all these 
three things in our animation. And then we want to uh, produce from this an MP4 movie with an advanced uh, encoding. So in order to do this, we'll do the animation in the movie maker, but we'll use a user defined procedure. So a small TCL script. Then we will render the individual frames in Targa format, again from Movie Maker, and we will encode the movie with an external tool here, FFmpeg, and I'm going to give you a bash script that shows the exact the exact options that I used. So I'm on my uh, say a new MT VMD session, and now I'm going to prepare my um, structure and my trajectory and all my visualization options. So I start with this mol new conf.grow to load my structure, then mol add file trash.xtc. So I'm loading my trajectory inside this existing molecule conf.grow. Then I will change the colors to colors that I like, set some visualization options, orthographic projection, a white background, no axis, then I will set my representations. I delete the default representation, just lines all over the place. And I create instead a new cartoon representation colored according to secondary structure. I show it only for the protein with this selection command. And finally, I create the representation with mall add red top. I will also set trajectory smoothing to get a smooth uh, animation. And I will uh, select the colors that I want to show for the secondary structure. So essentially, I want to show um, all uh, helices in orange and everything else in blue. Then I tell TVMD to do the first frame and to calculate the secondary structure for this frame. So if I play this in the uh, TK console, I get my protein loaded, my color set, and I'm at the start of the trajectory, ready for my movie. Now, my movie is another TCL script. This I took directly from the um, VMD documentation, and I just adapted it for my needs. So mostly, it is boilerplate code. When you want to use a user-defined procedure uh, to make a movie in VMD, you need to add a function or a procedure here, indicated by this proc keyword. That's called movie callback. And inside this movie callback procedure, you can do whatever you want. So I'm going to do some very simple things. First, animate next, which means go to the next frame in the trajectory. VMD calculate structure, which means recalculate the secondary structure for this new frame. And rotate the viewpoint around the Y axis by a small increment. This is enough for me to actually control exactly what happens in the movie making process. Then I have some boilerplate code, especially this enabled movie callback, which I need to call in VMD to ensure that my uh, usually defined procedure gets loaded in memory. Now I'm back to my main VMD window. I use the play command again to load this user movie.tcl script. And as I said, I need to call this enable movie callback so that my callback is, is registered in memory. Then I open the movie maker once again. And this time in the movie setting, instead of using trajectory, I will say user defined procedure. In the format, I will say just output the separate frames so that I can encode them myself with an external tool later. I choose a temporary working directory. Uh, set a name for my movie. Here I didn't because I'm just outputting raw frames anyway that I will assemble later. Uh, since you're using a, uh, we're using a user-defined procedure, the rotation angle and the trajectory step size parameters are ignored. Everything is controlled via our script that we described earlier. And we even need to set the movie duration ourselves. So we, here is how uh, I did it. I know that I will be displaying 501 frames. If I want a 24 frames per second frame rate, this will be 20.875 seconds. And this is what I entered here as the movie duration. Now I can hit make movie and get everything, uh, all this, the uh, individual's frame generated. The final step now is the encoding. 
So this is done, I said, via an external tool, FFmpeg. So here are the uh, typical options that you would use for uh, FFmpeg. I say frame rate 24 frames per second. I say take the separate frames that uh, VMD generated from this temporary directory. So VMD called them final.untitled.1.2.3, blah, 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 up to .501.tga. Um, here, the other option that I have, VF vFlip. You will probably need this because VMD has a bug where the uh, Targa frame that is generated are uh, uh, flipped upside down. So I don't know why this has not been fixed or if it's just a um, idiosyncrasy of the Targa file format, but you probably also need this if you generate Targa frames. If you generate JPEG frames, you won't need it. And the last option here is to select the codec that I want to use, libx265, which means encoding with the high quality H.265 codec. And I choose the output file name. When I run this, I will generate the movie. And this will provide me with something like this. So again, the, because of the uh, internet connection, uh, I don't really want to just show you the whole movie progressing. But here on the left, we have the first frame where we see our lysozyme folded with alpha helices. And then on the right, we have our last frame where we can see that the protein has been unfolded. We no longer have any helices and only a very little bit of secondary structure remaining. So you can see that we also rotated uh, a, uh, in the y-axis because you can see that the beta strands are not in the same position. And we can see that we did update the secondary structure calculation every second. Now, in closing, I want to give you some uh, point, online pointers to VMD. Uh, of course, there's the main VMD website. But one thing I really like is this using VMD documentation, which they call a tutorial, but it actually goes really in depth in many um, topics, including movies and scripting. The VMD user's guide is more of a reference guide. It's very dry, but it contains, for instance, this text reference for all the commands that you need in VMD. Compute Canada also has a VMD documentation for things that are specific to how to use VMD on our clusters. And finally, if you want to refresh yourself on the previous uh, Wiz Group webinar on VMD, here is the link. So I hope you enjoyed this and I'll be happy to take any question you might have. Someone had a question earlier. Um, it, would, it would be a great time to uh, ask it now. If you come with questions later, you can also uh, email the West Grid people and they will forward it to me. But I still have some time left, so feel free to ask away. Um, Olivier, you have a question in the chat, actually. Can you see the chat? We can't hear you, Olivier. So I see, is the step size based on the original trajectory or on top of the stepping used to import the trajectory? So the uh, step size that you see in VMD is the uh, step size in the trajectory that you loaded. So if you load your original MD trajectory, it's definitely the step size in your original trajectory. Uh, by step size, what VMD means is uh, each snapshot. So if your step size is one femtosecond or one picosecond or one nanosecond, that doesn't matter for VMD. VMD only understands the number of frames. So the step size is expressed in number of frames and corresponds exactly to what is in the trajectory. Mm -hmm. 
you are muted now. <laughs> my it's channel, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying there was another question just uh, just above Jason's as well. Okay, I assume when using tragic when stepping the movie maker that is the trajectory. Okay, the trajectory in memory and the original file they're the same. So the stepping is the same. Are there other questions for um, Olivier? If there are no questions, I will very quickly share my screen to advertise our upcoming uh, summer school, uh, autumn school that Alex and I are giving in case some of you are interested. We still have spots. Uh, so let me try to share my screen. Uh, doo -doo -doo. There we go. Okay, so every Monday and Tuesday next month, so in November, uh, we will be offering some teaching. Uh, the subjects cover, covered uh, are pretty intro subjects. There's gonna be uh, Bash, Git, HPC, intro to Python, uh, some intro to deep learning with PyTorch, uh, Chapel, Julia, and 3D scientific visualization. So if uh, you are interested, check out the website. I could actually pass it in the chat. It's also on the WestGrid uh, website. And uh, we'll see you there. And if you have other questions for Olivier, that's, uh, that's your chance, so don't hesitate. So I see another in the chat regarding uh, interactions with, uh, between molecules. If you have several molecules inside a single trajectory, they will both be displayed when you load this trajectory in VMD, which means that you will see the interactions uh, between these two partners. There are also uh, some analysis tools in VMD, uh, although I didn't cover them today. Uh, you could, for instance, uh, measure distances or angles between the two uh, partners. You could check for the available uh, surface area and see if it changes if you uh, see two partners binding, you would expect, for instance, the surface area to decrease. Um, but the molecules really need to be inside the same trajectory, of course. Are there other questions before we end this session? OK, well, if, if there are no more questions, Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Olivier. That was a really great presentation. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure. And I will end this session. Bye, everyone. <laughs>